Welcome to the I Can Fly podcast. We are so excited to share with you today our incredible conversation with Mr. Jack Nicholas. Not only one of the greatest golfers of all time, but truly one of the great athletes of all time. Frankly, sitting here, I have goosebumps just at the very thought that we had the opportunity to sit down with Mr. Nicholas. Coming from the same hometown of Columbus, Ohio, to say this is a childhood dream would be an understatement. Morgan and I were so grateful for his incredible humility in showing and sharing so many of his incredible lessons along his career. We started the conversation around why he fell in love with the game of golf and what made him so uniquely gifted at preparing for the major championships each year. Mr. Nicholas was incredibly specific around how he prepared, and I think there will be an amazing amount of things that you can take from this and apply to your daily life as well. Mr. Nicholas ended the conversation with touching on his thoughts around the state of the game today and what his concerns are for the future of the sport. We're so grateful for your time and in being here to listen with us today. Please enjoy this conversation with Mr. Jack Nicholas. We sat down at, at a, a dinner last, uh, just this July, and we met through the Bears Club, you know, being friends at the Bears Club, practicing, hitting balls together uh, almost 10 years ago now, mm -hmm. and uh, always had a great friendship and you know, whether it was growing up around Mirfield or the Bears Club, I've been fortunate to meet so many neat people over the years through what you've created. But it was just a few months ago that we sat down and said, boy, wouldn't it be neat to, you know, be able to start something where we could have conversations with folks and ask them questions about their life's journey and, and ups and downs along the way. And so just before we dive into anything, just again, thank you very much for taking sure. the time to be Pleasure. here with us. And really, uh, really special opportunity for Morgan and I and our families go back, you know, decades and, and, uh, so personally very cool opportunity Good. to get to sit down with you. Good. Yeah. And our, our goal here just between Jeg and I is we love to learn people's stories and, and share them with the world. And, and you're a person who has been such a huge influence on our life because of, of golf and, um, really everything that you've done with family and, um, your businesses on the side and uh, not to mention the the greatest golfer of all time and we've, we've looked up to you in so many ways and it's just a true honor to be in your presence Thank today. You. Um, and I guess we'd like to start chronologically like when when you were a kid sure. growing up what was it like um, in uh, in Ohio who who got you into the game of golf? Well uh... I, I grew up on the uh, high state campus, actually. My dad had a pharmacy on the campus. And uh, so I was uh, in amongst all the high state athletes all the time. They're mm. in the drugstore all the time. And uh, uh, my father broke his ankle like about 1946, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I was about six years old at the time. And I remember carrying him into the uh, house. And uh, he... You know, I thought they just sprained his ankle. That's what he thought. Everybody else thought that. And then it it, it, it didn't heal. And so finally it ended up, uh, he had, it actually had been broken and they ended up having arthritis. So they ended up having, he ended up having three operations on it. Wow. And had to fuse his ankle. And the doctor told him, he says, Charlie, he says, he says, you need to take up something that you need to walk. Yeah. And so he says, well, I played golf as a kid. And he says, well, I think maybe that's a pretty good thing for you to do. So my dad, he was a good athlete. He played football, basketball, and baseball at Ohio State. Yeah. And so uh, he uh, he was a pretty good golfer as a kid. Actually, he held a couple of course records throughout Columbus. And uh, the uh, um, we moved out to Upper Arlington, which is a suburb of Ohio. He, he started, he had another drugstore out there, paid an anchor at a shopping center, and rejoined Santa Country Club. I was 10 years old at the time. And, well, actually, probably nine, but... but that next summer was Ted, and uh, he couldn't make a game because he couldn't walk. So I would carry the bag, <laughs> and we'd go out and we'd go a hole, and he'd have to sit down and rest. I'd chip and putt and fool around, and finally, after about uh, you know half a dozen times of doing this, he says, "You want to learn how to play golf?" I said, "Sure." <laughs> so he introduced me to every sport, mm. and so uh, uh, 
I started I started a, a junior class like a million other kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, 60 of us, I think they were about. And after about two or three weeks, uh, Jack Grout's first year at Scioto. And uh, after about two or three weeks, uh, Grout would say, Jackie boy, he says, come out here and show these kids how to hit a how to hit a proper divot. Show these kids how to hit a high shot. Show these kids how to hit a hook. Show these kids how to hit a slice. You know, that made me feel pretty good mm-hmm. using using me as an example. I've only been out there three or four weeks. And uh, uh, so anyway, I remember about mid-July that first year, and uh, the bill from Scioto came home. And there was a bill, I think it was $370, and for, for, for uh, practice balls on the range. <laughs> In those days, you got a bucket of balls, about 60 balls for 35 cents. I had a lot of balls. <laughs> and so uh, my dad said, Jack, I says, what, what is this? He said, I said, well, Dad, you told me you want me to learn how to play golf. So I'm just taking golf balls trying to learn. Wow. He says, okay. He says, I've never heard another word about it. Of course, and Jack Grout understood what was going on, too. Mm. And he stopped, stopped, the bills stopped coming. He never never, never charged me for lessons. Wow. Or he became like a second father to me. Mm-hmm. And so that's how I started playing golf in Columbus. And what was it that? about the game of golf that you liked like your your father introduced you to it but there must have been some click oh, yeah. inside of you that was like oh. well you know i uh, i played football i was a good football player i played quarterback linebacker did all the putting and place kicking mm-hmm. and uh but I, I figured out you know that i probably my hands were big enough for football and so i finally decided you know that when i started qualifying for a national tournaments uh, as a junior, I said it may cut my mind between football. That my dad played pro football, and so it broke his heart. But uh, uh, I said, Dad, I think I'm I'm not going to play I'm not going to play football this year. I want to play I want to continue my golf in the fall. I said, Okay. Then I played basketball. I played baseball. But I got rid of baseball because of they conflicted with golf. And I got mm-hmm. tired of waiting for thirty kids or twenty kids to come to play baseball. <laughs> Where I could go to the golf course at whatever hour I wanted to go in the morning and, and come home at night when it got dark and play golf all day. And, and whatever effort I put in it, I got the result. Mm-hmm. I liked that. Yeah. If I wanted to work, then I could work and I could do, I could get my own results. So I think, I think that's what really attracted me to golf is that, uh, you know, it's, I mean, I played tennis too, but you always need somebody on the other side of the net. Right. You know, and, and playing basketball, you always need somebody to guard you or whatever, you know, and I, I like basketball. I was actually, I was recruited at Ohio State for basketball. Wow! So I, I mean, I was a good basketball player. I would, I, I would have played, and uh, but uh, you know, I didn't want to be ninth or tenth man sitting on a bench. Yeah, they won the NCAA while I was there, so they had to be a pretty good basketball team. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyway, uh, I just gravitated to golf, and I was really lucky at Ohio State. They had a the golf coach at Ohio State was a fellow named Bob Kepler. Yeah, it was a very good player. And but he had he had the common sense never to try to teach me. He knew that Jack Grout was my teacher. They were good friends. Mm. He, he 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 was more on, you know, mental and, and advice of, of how to do things. And he also got me into fishing. That's uh, <laughs> Kepler would look at it. He'd look at the day and he'd look at it, he says, he says, hey Nick. He says, man. He says it's a beautiful day today. He says it's too nice a day to play golf. He says let's he says let's these other guys started you and I'll step out the back door and go fishing. No. <laughs> He knew I was going to have my game in shape. He mm-hmm. never worried about mm-hmm. that. That's awesome. So that's what we did. And we'd slip out. They started fly, taught me how to fly fish. Fly fishing. Mm-hmm. And that's how I got started in that. But, mm. you know, uh, he was a great guy. I remember my sophomore year at, at Ohio State, I made the Walker Cup team. And uh, I was kind of hesitant to go in and see Kepler because, you know, we're getting ready to play the golf season. And Kep says, man, are you going to have a great spring? I said, I know. We're going to have a good spring here at Kepler. No, no, no. You're not going to school. What are you talking about? You're going to go play the Masters. You're going to go play the North-South. You're going to go play the British Amateur, the Walker Cup. I says, you're gone this spring. He says, you play next year. <laughs> so I was a quarter, we had a quarter system at last day. So I didn't go to spring that quarter. Yeah. That quarter. I, went, I went out to uh, went play golf. And it, was a, it was a great experience for me. And uh, I came back next year, played my last two years at Ohio State. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. But Kepler was just, it was just, he was a great guy. Yeah. yeah what a good coach. To, to allow you that freedom. Oh, yeah. They, they, they wouldn't do that today. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they wouldn't have the common sense to do that today. Mm-hmm. And so these guys, I mean, I was born, uh, Jack Grout was wonderful. 
My dad was great. My dad was my best friend. Uh, we spent time together. We, you know, we did we did everything together. And uh, uh, then, uh, of course, then Jack Grout came along, and Jack Grout. I mean, Jack Grout was fantastic. And Jack Grout taught me how to be responsible for myself. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I remember when Bobby Jones. I sat down with him at the Augusta, and he said, "You know, he said I had my seven lean years, as they were called." Uh, it was from 14 to 21. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's hardly lean years, I would think. But anyway, <laughs> he didn't win anything during that period, time period. He says, he says, if I didn't become a golfer until I learned that to be able to manage myself, control myself, fix myself on the golf course, and didn't run back to Sterling Maiden, who was his teacher. Mm. And he says, when I could do that, then I became a golfer. And Jack Grout, that's what Jack Grout told me from day one. Jack Grout must have come to, he must have come to 500 golf tournaments. Not once did he set a foot on a practice tee. Wow, really? Not once. And he'd be back in he'd be back in the in the gallery or back in the bleachers. And if I had a problem, I'd walk back and say, "Hey, Jay Grout, what do you see?" He says, "Check your head position." <laughs> or he'd say, "Check your ball position." He says, "He says your he says check your pocket." He didn't say, "Tell me what to do." Mm. He said, "Check it. Figure it Let out. Let me figure mm -hmm. it out myself." Mm -hmm. And I, I and that's how I learned how to play golf. So, you know, when I played tournament golf, if I came down the, I, I did it lots of times. If I came down the last nine holes of the U.S. Open and I may have been in the lead and I was starting to swing away that I didn't like, I corrected it right then. Mm. And I said, you know, I always made sure that I picked a shot or two that I wouldn't really get myself in too much trouble while I was experimenting to figure out what it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I let it go. By the time I got done with the round, you know, I either won the tournament or didn't. But at least I, I got my game back to where I could compete. Mm. And and doing it under pressure is the best way to learn. It's the only way to learn. Yeah, I mean, they talk about these guys that, uh, oh, this guy's what a great putter he was, what a stroke, what a thing. I said, well, when did he use it? What he won? Mm -hmm. To me, you know, I didn't I didn't consider myself a great putter on a from a stroke or anything else. But I but when it, but when I had to make it, I made it, and that, I mean, I think that's. That's, like, Palmer was that way. Arnold made a lot of putts when he had to make them. Watson made a lot of putts when he had to make them. Mm. Guys who win, that's what they do. They make they, they, they make their putts when they have to. Mm. The, the the good putters with the great strokes, they they you know they they make them when it doesn't make any difference. Absolutely. Mm. Talk through like in in those moments coming in the back nine of a major or something like that. Whether it was putting, like we've just mentioned here. What were some common things like in your routine, whether it was pre-shot or during the shot? Were there things that you were always kind of focused on in your well, routine? Well, I never had a pre-shot. Uh, I never had a routine. Uh, I just sort of, you know, whatever I was doing at the time is what I did. Yeah. But I mean, to me, that you come down the stretch when you're in a contention, and it's, you're supposed to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love playing golf, and I love the competition. I love contention, being in contention. And I quite often, a lot, to, and I did it quite often, coming down the stretch, maybe the 13th, 14th, 15th hole, I'd be coming down and maybe one shot ahead or one shot behind, and i just sort of stop. Mm. And I'd try to take stop and <sighs> took a deep breath, mm. looked around me, watched all these people running down the sides of the fairways, <laughs> the gallery, and, and uh, watching how much fun they were having, and so forth and so on. I said, you know, this is why I did this. These people are loving this. I'm loving it. He says, let's enjoy it. Go play. Mm -hmm. And it relaxed me, but allowed me to get back and focus on what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so I did that a lot, and uh, it served me well. Did anyone teach you to do that? Or Sorry? Did anyone teach you to do that? No, I just did it. Just fig yeah, figured, figured it out. I figured out. You know, like, as I say, Jack Brown taught me to be responsible for my own self. Mm -hmm. And so to be responsible, you had to figure out ways to calm yourself, way to charge yourself up. And, you know, if I... If I was not playing very well and I was, was getting very complacent, I'd sort of, I'd sort of stop and almost the same thing. I said, "What are you doing? <laughs> you know, let's get with us. Let's figure out what we're doing here. Let's let's get on with it and let's let's get, let's get back on track." Mm. And you know, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But uh, it's uh, you know, in golf, if you win, you know, ten fifteen percent of the time, you're you're the top of the top of the heap. Yeah, and so. You know, you lose a lot. Obviously, you all know that. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you when you lose a lot, you learn a lot of things about yourself and so forth. I mean, uh, but I had far more seconds than I had first. So, 
Yeah. But all that meant was that I put myself in a position to win. Mm -hmm. And always had, I was always there. And that was what that was what uh, I thought was fun to be, always be in the competition. Did I handle it all perfect every time? No, no. I handled it enough enough that, that I won. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, all I could ever feel, feel like I did was I would, if I prepared myself pro properly, I was ready to play. And I gave it my best effort. If somebody played better, fine and dandy. Mm -hmm. Well done. Mm -hmm. Shake your hand out, say well done, and uh, move on to the next week. That's the nice thing about golf. It's, you know, you move on to the next week. That's true. Yeah. That was one of my questions about preparation. When you're getting ready for a tournament, are there things that you're doing to get yourself into that mindset, whether you're sitting at home, whether you're on the range, where there's drills to give you some extra pressure, um, well, I, never, I never did any drills, mm. and uh, the uh, I always felt like I could get myself ready to play maybe seven or eight times a year. <laughs> uh, so I basically felt like the four majors, mm -hmm. and then the first an odd tournament here or there that I really wanted to play well at, I would get, you know, prepare for that. But uh, uh, you know, even though I'd be playing somewhere between fifteen and twenty tournaments, I would basically really concentrate on four really mm -hmm. and i use a lot of those other tournaments to prepare for that tournament and so when and when the new year rolled around i started thinking about the masters okay what am i going to play this year uh that'll give me you know half a dozen tournaments before augusta because mm -hmm. i generally took the fall off and i mean i just sometimes didn't hit a golf ball for two or three months mm -hmm. and uh i say what am I going to get myself in shape for? What courses do I want to play? I always liked to play Pebble because I thought Pebble was always a pretty good Even though we had, the course was crappy and the, and the weather was crappy that time of year, mm -hmm. you know, in January. But I, I, I still like to play it. And, uh, uh, you know, I'd pick whatever other tournaments there were. I always tried to pick, I always tried to pick a couple of tournaments, not to be selfish, just, just to take a couple of tournaments that I hadn't played for a while. Mm. And I tried to stick those in. Maybe it would be Palm Springs, or maybe it would be uh, Phoenix, or maybe it would be uh, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 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 I and I throw a tournament in, but I'd also uh, I'd also prepare myself to, to and I try to pick the tournaments early in the year that would be the shots that I would try to use at Augusta. Absolutely. And which is Augusta, you're trying to hit the ball high, mm -hmm. and you try to you try to, and so so I get to the Florida tournaments. And I try to be very careful with the Florida tournaments, even though I lived in Florida. I like to play in Florida. The wind was going to be there, and you're not going to, and your wind is probably not going to be that much at Augusta. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to get, I didn't want to get a wind swing, right? And and get myself off base that way. So I tried to watch for the. I mean, Jacksonville was always a tournament that, because that was now the Players Championship, but it was always a tournament that I tried to stay away from a little bit because it it was always cold and windy. Yeah, you know? and so anyway. I did that to prepare for Augusta. I got ready for Augusta. I always, and, I, and, and every, all the four majors, I always tried to go in the week ahead of time. And Augusta, I would go in really early. And even though I knew the course well, uh, I would play a tournament the week before. Mm. Uh, I'd go in, I'd see, see what I could shoot. If I could shoot 275, 277, whatever I would shoot. I knew by, by what I would do and, and, and perform that the conditions were not going to change but from then to the next week. I mean, regardless, I guess maybe the same golf course the conditions change every year. Yeah, and so uh, I tried to do that. So then, and then I so when I got done the week week before, uh, I would go home and take the weekend off, put my clubs in the closet for a couple of days. Uh, I might might hit a ball or two on Monday, uh, Tuesday. I'd come out and play nine holes. Usually, I'd play. Uh, or maybe 18, I don't know, at, at Augusta. Mm -hmm. and then once, but, but when I got to Augusta, I had everything out of the way. I mean, I, I knew how the greens were going to be. I knew how the fairways were going to play. There weren't any rough, but, it was, you know, but yeah, I, I knew how the sand was. Mm -hmm. I mean, the sand Augusta changes a lot. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, all I had to do was play golf. And so that's what I tried to do. So then, then after the Masters, I, I let myself go down. I always try to build myself up and then let myself drop after the tournament. So I, I tried not to play afterwards. 
in the, in the back of the old days, we ended up a lot of times having the tournament of champions out of La Costa. It was usually the week after yeah. the Masters. I didn't really didn't want to do that, although I, because of my preparation, a lot of times, my it carried over into into, into the tournament of champions, and I won it a few times. Right, but uh, your tournament of champions now is the start of the year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, did, we we weren't then. Anyway, uh, I let myself go down, and I wouldn't play a whole lot. I played a couple of tournaments. Yeah, and, and in the spring, and then I built myself up. Did the same thing for the U.S. Open, preparing for the U.S. Open, and then I and then I do the same thing, cut down, and then I could go to the British Open. I always go a week ahead of time, at least for the British Open, mm-hmm. and I'd play a lot of golf. And I, and I sort of enjoyed that time because a lot of the other guys went early, then, and we used to play a lot of pretty good matches for each other. Mm. Uh, Wisecoff and I used to play a lot of golf together over there, and uh, we, you know, we played. Uh, Play everybody, beat everybody, or, or get beat, whatever it was. Now, were they money games or just for oh, yeah, fun? Yeah. 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 But, I, but yeah. I never played more than 20 bucks. Right. Hmm. Just for I, pride, basically. I, well, the reason, uh, I, I did, you know, that's a pretty interesting question. Uh, I never played money in golf. I mm-hmm. played, I was playing every week for money. Why in the world would I want right. to waste my time during the week or, or practice? So, what I did is I always felt like if I made a game and and frankly, Arnold and I are about the only ones we played for twenty bucks. Most of the rest of us played for ten. <laughs> and uh, I always felt like one, if I, I got a guy who wants to play golf, and I give him, and I and, and the first tee, if I give him too many strokes, it's not a game. Mm-hmm. Two, if I don't give him enough strokes, I'm hustling. Mm-hmm. And three, I don't want to lose a friend. Yeah, that's true. So yeah. I just don't do that, and I never did it. And uh, uh, Cliff Drysdale is the only guy that I did. You know Cliff, I'm talking about the tennis player? Mm-hmm. Cliffy came in at the Bears Club and he said, he said so we're going to play $50 closeout. I said, Cliffy, I don't do that. He says, no, no, no. We're playing $50 closeout. I said, see, <laughs> Cliffy, I said, I don't do that with my friends. He says, he says Jack, you're not going to lose a friend. That's what we're going to play. I said, okay, okay. <laughs> so I gave Cliffy, I don't know, about eight shots or whatever it was. So I got a cabinet out in the in the kitchen, it's just loaded with fifty dollars bills. Just no. <laughs> paper on there. I get several thousand dollars of them of, of Cliff's money, That's which awesome. which was fun. Yeah, but he laughed at it. Of course, we take pictures of it every time. But he comes and so forth. And so forth. Kept growing, huh? It kept growing every time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but it's just fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know. And uh, so I, I never spent any of his money. I always put it on the, on the up on the counter. But anyway, that getting back to then we're back to British Open. Then after British Open. Then we had the PGA Championship. Mm-hmm. PGA Championship. I never played the PGA Championship early except for 1971 when we played here at Palm Beach Gardens. We played in February. You know, I didn't probably prepare as hard for the PGA Championship because I'd already been playing golf all year long. Mm-hmm. And maybe I'd only play a couple or three practice rounds the week before. But, uh, you know, to me, if you have the opportunity to prepare and you don't take advantage of it, then I think you're not you're not giving yourself the best chance to to win the the most important tournaments. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'd love to go back to your time at Ohio State. Sure. Um, you grew up, you know, in your family in the pharmacy world. You know, your, your father had drug stores. And you kind of had a decision at hand coming out of Ohio State, whether to pursue playing golf professionally and for a living or if you wanted to go down the pharmacy route. And I it, it, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but I think it's an interesting kind of comparison to where a lot of kids come into where they've got a dream that they want to chase their whole life versus something that maybe feels like the more practical route. And I'd love to just explore kind of what your thinking was going there. A lot of kids like to be, do what their father did. Sure. Mm -hmm. You're the same thing. Yeah. You know, your family has been in racing forever. Yeah. And, uh, uh, the, uh, my dad, uh, my dad didn't care what I did, but I went to I went to pre, through pre pharmacy, yeah. and before I got into pharmacy school, my dad said, "Jack, he says, and I was made the Walker Cup team by that time and won the U.S. Amateur." He, says, he said, "Do you think that that's really the right place for you?" He said, "You can't you can't use your golf behind a counter," mm-hmm. and so I switched out of pharmacy school to the business school, and took up and, and took an insurance major, and which I hated. <laughs> And and uh, I no, I sold insurance. I sold insurance, and uh, uh, I got that. I was the youngest person ever licensed in the state of Ohio for insurance. I licensed on my twentieth birthday. Wow! And uh, by the time I, by the time in the fall of sixty one, I was twenty one years old, 
Uh, I was making from selling insurance and doing some public relations work for a couple of different companies. And I was making about $35,000 a year. A thirty-five thousand dollars a year in nineteen sixty. Pretty good. Yeah, it's like maybe three hundred thousand dollars today. Really? Yeah, and so I was making pretty good living, and so. But I said, you know, what did I really want to do? I mean, to me, I was going selling ten thousand dollar insurance policy, life insurance policies to my fraternity brothers <laughs> who needed them like a hole in the head. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was ridiculous. I didn't. I should. I shouldn't see anything in that. I was doing some work for. Uh, for a, a company that came been called Parker and Company, which handled several of the airlines. So I did some of the PR work for that, and I did a Slack company. I did some work for, and, you know. So I so I was I was able to make make a good living, but uh, I really wanted to be the best I could be at playing golf. Mm -hmm. That's what it really mattered about it to. So I said to uh, Barbara, I said, you know, you know, it, it, but Barbara married me. She had no idea that I was going to be a professional golfer. She, I'm just another. Ohio State student. We got married after a third year in college. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's what we did. And so uh, I turned pro and uh, I felt like uh, that was uh, that was my best avenue to, to uh, compete. I said I wanted to be the best. And I couldn't. The only way to do that was to play against the pros. Mm -hmm. uh, there was that amateurs. In those days, Bobby Jones wrote me a letter. Uh, the day after I turned pro, I got the letter, actually. <laughs> and uh, it, was a, it was a letter saying that, you know, Jack, he says, I know that, uh, uh, well, he started off, he said something, he says, you know, I had a great amateur career. We were hoping that maybe you might be able to follow in my footsteps and be in an amateur career could carry into the game of golf and so forth and wow. so on. And uh, he says, however, I understand the temptation of professional golf. He said, he says, not only the money, but the competition is, is greater there than it is. It was an amateur golf while I played. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. He says, he said, if you happen to turn pro, he says, I've had a great relationship with Spalding all these years, so maybe you might want to try to get Jake Spalding out. No. <laughs> it was kind of a good, I love the letter. It was, it was, a, it was, it was, it was a very fun letter, right? And yeah. I became a really, Jones became a good friend. Hmm. And uh, so anyway, the. Uh, uh, Do you still have that letter? Yeah, I got the museum. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I got, I got most of that stuff. And so uh, Jones, uh, Jones was great. And I decided that, you know, uh, and when I turned pro, I remember going out my first year on tour. I did an interview with a newspaper writer. I think at my second week, and they said, Jax, what's your expectations this year? Mm. What do you think would be a successful year? I said, well, I think if I won $30,000, uh, I think I would be a pretty successful year. And then I remember the next week, the article came out, and this guy, the older guys, the Tommy Bolts and the boys says, look at this young kid. He thinks he can come out here to make $30,000 on the tour. And what we went, or where's his head? <laughs> well, anyway, that's fine. Yeah. I made, I made, I made, uh, on tour, official money, I made 60, 61,000. Wow. Like that, that year. I was third on the money list. Arlo, I think, was 64,000 or something like it. Was leading money, where I think Gary was second. And uh, uh, then I won the World Series, which was a $50,000 tournament. So, and I won uh, with a little bit more. So I won hundred and one hundred and twenty thousand, maybe my first year on tour, wow. mm. like, uh, plus whatever endorsements and so forth I had. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, that was far exceeded my expectations when I started. And uh, you know, but it wasn't about money. It was about that I was growing as a golfer. I mean, when I won the U.S. Open, I won, I won Seattle and Portland. I won uh, uh, the World Series, and you know. I was, and I, I, I don't know how many seconds I had. I probably had, I had three seconds before I won the U.S. Open, mm -hmm. and uh, I maybe I maybe had one or two after that. I don't remember, wow. but uh, you know, I started to be a pretty regular player as far as competing and being in the mix. So that was that was where it came from. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And speaking of Bobby writing you a letter, are there any other people or players or athletes or? Um, friends in your life who were real mentors for you, like growing up and even through your professional career? Not really. I mean, I, my, my dad, Grout, and, uh, but I mean, I, I got a lot of letters to you. I mean, I can go through and pretty much name the stars of yesterday, and <laughs> a lot of them I received letters from a lot. I mean, one of the, one of the, one of the, one of the most 
nicest letters I received was that I'd played golf with Vince Lombardi mm -hmm. uh, up, in, up in Green Bay. And the first letter I got, well, my dad passed. Uh, he passed, he was 56 years old. He passed in 1970. And uh, uh, was from Vince Lombardi. Mm. And so I got, I still have that letter. And, you know, it's, uh, uh, I got a lot, of, a lot of those kind of letters. And I get, I've, got, I've got letters, I got a letter just the other day from uh, Barry Saunders. Mm. Oh, wow. I mean, I did a thing for him for, you know, playing football in Detroit and they honored him up there and I dropped him. I did a, I did a video for him. But I get I got a lot of a lot of nice letters through the years from a lot of nice people, mm -hmm. and it's, it's it's nice to be able to kind of because I met a lot of guys. I mean, that picture behind you up there, you might want to take a picture of later. Is, we saw it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you see that one? Yeah. yeah, we were checking it out earlier. Yeah, I mean that was uh, 1999 uh, uh, December of uh, Athlete of the Century mm -hmm. banquet, Sports Illustrated, and that's a pretty good athletes in there. It's <laughs> an unbelievable picture. shot yeah. at MSG Madison Square Garden, 1999. Yeah. Said. That was that was that was actually at the Waldorf. That wasn't the medicine. Oh, okay. Card. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. If we can take a picture of it, and maybe share. Yeah, that's fine. Sure. No, I love so it. Cool. I get people to name them all. See if they can name them all. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Could you name them all? Probably not all of them, but no. most of them. And the ones that miss usually are the Jackie Joyner, Kersey, and Bob Beeman on the end. Beeman was a long jumper, jumper in uh, Mexico City that oh, jumped wow. longer than anybody else. And, wow. But all the rest of them are pretty pe but people you know, Michael Jordan and you know Tiger and. Gretzky and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Muhammad Ali, those kind of guys are <laughs> yeah. out there. Pele. And when you were in the presence of, of these other people, did you ever ask them questions about how they prepared or was it kind of like... Not much. Or just friendly kind of talk? and Pretty much friendly. That's most, most of the guys, that's what I've always done. Yeah. I, mean, I, never, I never really exchanged a lot of information with other guys. Mm. Golfers, yeah. I mean, we... We talk about different things, not a lot, but I mean, you know, I talk a little bit about it. Yeah, I feel like when I see you at the Bears Club, sometimes like we've had lunch together and I ask you questions about your chipping or putting and things like if I'm having issues and you're always so kind to to offer advice. And I think you've done that with, with a, a bunch of guys around the, the club. Right? I'm happy to help. You know, it keeps me young, mm -hmm. keeps me relevant to what's going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I get I get sort of flattered and, and when, when, when the young guy comes from me and it, he doesn't listen to his father, he probably doesn't listen to his grandfather. And here I'm his grandfather's age and he, he's asking me questions of what's advice. I'm sitting there saying, really? <laughs> but that's kind of, it's kind of, that's what I say, it's really, makes you feel good. But uh, a lot of the guys have come to me and I, I try to help them give, them, give them what I thought and how I thought and uh, how I felt like uh, what I see and, not many of them ask me much about their game. Mm. Mm. They really ask me more about mentally how I prepare and try, mm -hmm. try to relate it to themselves. But every once in a while I get one that and I want to talk about the game and so forth and so on. I had uh, one of the first ones that came down to me was uh, Trevor Immelman. Mm -hmm. And Trevor came down and had lunch and it's right before the Masters. They went and won the Masters. Mm -hmm. Well, Charles Schwartzel heard that he'd come back, and Charles came back out of the, whenever Charles won, he came down, same thing, he won the Masters. <laughs> so I, I, I was pretty, you know, made, made me feel pretty good that I helped both of those kids, uh, huh. you know, gave him enough advice about how to play and what to do. Yeah. Patrick Cantley came to me at Muirfield, he said, Jackie said, I can't play this golf course, I, I struggle to play this golf course, how do you play it? So we spent, we spent a couple hours talking about the golf course, then he's won it twice now. Wow. Uh, so I remember when I played, before I played the Masters for the first time, in 2015, I came to you and asked some advice, and um, yeah, it was it was a great first experience. I didn't win, obviously, with top 25, and it was um, all the the subtleties of the greens and where to be on them was was really. Uh, I guess really is special. a pretty, I guess is a pretty simple situation. Mm -hmm. The middle of the green is no there's no harm at Augusta. Yeah, hmm. you only know, got two holes at Augusta. I think are the middle of the green is. Not great. Second hole, you can't ever keep it in the middle of grade. Yeah, that's true. And I think the, uh, well, probably six is a little bit that way too. Mm -hmm. You can't keep it in the middle of grade. When you were saying earlier about the bunkers changing a lot at Augusta, like what did you mean by that? The wetness? Or you know, the, the type of sand that they have. Oh, they change them. Oh, they well, they, they've used the sand out of North Carolina. I think it's North Carolina. Feldspar, I think it was her, was her um, um, quarry. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, 
I'm sure that the sand changed a little bit, but remember, I guess the sand is so heavy. Yeah. And the, you almost have to hit a bunker shot twice as hard as you do any place else to get anything out of it, mm -hmm. and you can't get any spit out of it. Mm -hmm. And, That's crazy. I, and they, they've changed that sand again. They've just changed it at times. The sand, I guess, is better now than when, when I played. Mm -hmm. Probably better than when you played. Yeah. yeah. And it, uh, I never liked the sand against. I thought it was. I thought it was really difficult. It's hard not to get spin out of. Kind of frustrating, actually. <laughs> well, yeah. You like. You like. If you want to spin the ball, you like to be able to. Yeah. If you can't spin the ball, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Just play the shot. Right. But uh, uh, when you when you get a sand that looks like you can do it, and, you, and nothing happens, and the ball, the club just goes, <laughs> sort of sticks in it, and then, yeah. and the and the ball comes out and just sort of, <laughs> and then just yeah, you, you sure you say. Man, I'm a better bunker player than that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think I think it's the most difficult sand we play. I'd agree, probably. Hmm. Is is there any other tips over the years for Augusta playing it specifically, like that? Well, I think that I think Augusta has always been, uh, and it's, I think it's in, very individually. Mm -hmm. Is 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 play within what you can do. Uh, Billy Casper and uh, Zach Johnson. Both won Augusta. They never hit it at a par five, and so you know, for them that was the right thing to do. They're both good wedge players, right? And uh, I think Casper actually won. I think the same way. Did I say Casper? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I said Casper. Casper and Zach. It's very much a right to left golf course, what you want it to be. But if you figure it out, you got to play as many left to right shots at Augusta as you do right to left. I mean, you've got off the tee. I mean, number one is basically can, should be left to right. Mm -hmm. Number two is right to left. Uh, upper, number three basically is left to right. Yeah, for the slope of the fairway. Yeah, five. I don't think you want to be playing too much right to left. You want to, you don't want that ball kicking left. Mm -hmm. Seven doesn't really make any difference. Eight is uh, if you can carry the bunkers. I mean, you can hit it any way you want to. Yeah. Nine's right to left. Mm -hmm. Ten's right to left. Eleven is now left to right. Yeah. Bad lower. Thirteen's right to left. Fourteen's right to left. Fifteen. I play left fifty left to right more than that. Seventeen more left to right. Eighteen more left to right. Yeah. So that's off. So you got a lot more left to right. You think, but into the greens at Augusta, mm -hmm. you know, the shots into the greens. Like the, one's a little bit more right to left. Two, two. You don't have a choice. I think. I, I think two. The second shot at two is to me the, the worst shot in major championship golf. <laughs> not, huh. not tough. Worst. I mean, you stand it on your head on a. Downhill, right to left slope. Yeah, you got a big tree sticking out on you. You got a green that'll only accept something from left to right, and you got to play a duck hook. Yeah, I just think it's a terrible shot. Yeah, it's crazy. And, and I mean, I, I don't, and I don't know. I'm back in about oh, I don't know, forty years ago or something. Horn Harden was I was I was helping them do some things at Augusta, and I and I said Horde, I said you got to fix a second hole with the design. Yeah, mm -hmm. I said to me the bunker should be on the left side, not the right side, mm -hmm. and I said. You can you can, you bunker the left side and make it so that if somebody does bomb it over it, fine. But you know, uh, they they really need to. Put, the only way you can really play the hole the way the hole the green will accept is play out to the right and in. Mm -hmm. So the guys now they can drive it over that bunker on the right. You got an easy shot. Yeah. But how many people can do that? Yeah. Dozen. Yeah. So you know that 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 to me is it, it, that doesn't really set well. Hmm. But it's. Uh, I mean, Augustus, Augustus, and golf course—you got to be patient with, for sure. The green, and you know, I never—I don't think you try to ever make putts at Augusta. You try to make sure that you're close. Mm -hmm. If the fall falls in, it's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I don't know how many years I've played Augusta where I didn't three putt a green, and you know that was only through one way because of, of making sure that I didn't leave myself a second putt. Right. Second putts at Augusta are really tough. Yeah, I mean, a sharp breaking little little. Angle putts in the and the and, the, and the, I don't know whether it's grain or not grain, but it seems like it. Yeah, a lot of gr yeah. a lot of break, a lot of break, and whether it's grain or just break, I don't know. But you know, it's it they're 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 very subtle, subtly difficult. Hmm. And maybe not so subtle. They hit you right in the face because you had <laughs> break a leg walking onto the greens. But anyway, uh, I think you just got to be patient. <clears throat> you got to play. <clears throat> I say play the center of the green. Let's, the first hole is a perfect example. Hmm. You got four pin motions. You got front left, back left, back right, and middle right. Hmm. You put the ball in the center of the green there. You know you have a you have a birdie putt all four times. Yeah. 
And so I always played to the center grade and just fudged a little bit towards where the pin was. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and then, you know, second, obviously, pins either right or left. So you have to, you have to play to that. But three, three's always played to the middle of the grade. Sure. You're an idiot if you play to the left side of the grade. Yeah. Because you could hit it on the right side of the grade. And if you throw a little draw into it, Spin, yeah. it'll, 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 it'll trickle right down, down the hill to where you yeah. want it. Mm -hmm. If you don't want it to trickle down, you better be playing it left to right to keep it up to the right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it goes through the golf course of being, you know, being very sensible and smart about how you play it. Mm. That's, that's, so that's why I felt about it. It's like a game of chess. I'm sorry? It's like a game of chess. Oh, yeah. To, to a large degree, it's, it's a very, very uh, uh, strategic golf course that you've got to really figure out. And the conditions change when it's wet and when it's dry. It's night and day True. Hmm. of how it plays. Mm -hmm. This would be a great master's warm-up conversation, <laughs> exactly. talking through the golf course. Now you always get there, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I remember reading Golf My Way uh, back when I was 15 for the first time and getting to hear you talk now about, you know, Jack Grout and how much he instilled in you really to be your own coach, be able to coach yourself when you're on the golf course. If there was one thing, honestly, now sitting here that I would take away from Golf My Way is is that it's it, that was golf your way. And so much of the book is coaching you on to how to find golf your way personally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious why, you know, you've always been a, you've always been a teacher. You've always wanted to help, you know, juniors learn. I, I, in preparing for this conversation today, I found a story about a young man that wrote you a letter. Uh, he was a right-handed, you know, uh, individual. Like, like queer. <laughs> yeah. And uh, wrote you, said, said he loved, loved the golf swing left-handed, but everybody thought he'd be better right-handed. What do you think I should do? And uh, you, you, you know, wrote him back and said, I think you should stick with what, what feels right and. Like you said, that individual is Mike Weir. He's done all right. Yeah, all right. And still is. Still, he's had a great run on the Champions Tour yeah, lately Mike, too. Mike's nice guy, nice player. Yeah. And you know, uh, I mean, she. A lot of guys are uh, left-handed and play right-handed. A lot of guys mm -hmm. were left-handed, played right-handed. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Hogan was left-handed. Mm -hmm. uh, really? Yeah, I think Hogan, Hogan was left-handed. Uh, uh, Bob Charles was right-handed. Uh, Let's see. Uh, I think Mickelson is right-handed. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's true. I mean, Mickelson throws the ball and writes, writes right-handed. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you got. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think yeah, there, there, there are several other guys that were opposite. I think Billikoff was left-handed. He played right-handed. Uh, yeah, I'm sure there's others. Yeah, for mm. sure. So. Throughout your career, throughout your life, there you've obviously had so many highs. What are some lows that you had, whether it's in golf or in relationships or family, and, and how did you get through them? Well, I was blessed with having Barbara and mm. to start off with. Barbara's, uh, you know, she's, she's, she's kept the lows away. And if we didn't have any lows with the family, we're, family's good, they get five good kids we got 24 grandkids now <laughs> by the end of this year we'll have uh our seventh great grandchild wow congrats yeah so it's uh you know it, that's it's that's a lot and uh, all of them are good kids i haven't had issues with any of them and uh i think that largely is due to to barbara and 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 uh and, and instilling in our kids uh the right way to live and bring up bring up bring up people to so you don't have those issues and uh, the kids, the kids seem to bring up their kids pretty much that way. Mm. I mean, that's I think that's it. Lows I've had, you know, in golf I've had a few. I mean, we all we all have a few. Uh, I think the periods of what I didn't play well and uh, I was uh, struggling with it. I, I always went back to fundamentals, or uh, and, and that's what Grout taught me to do. Uh, I went through I went through a period where I got very complacent. I think it was uh, after I won the U.S. Open in 67. I didn't win again until 70. And, uh, I mean, majors, I won, I don't know how many tournaments I won. I probably won six or seven tournaments or so. And uh, in between, but, you know, my father passed away in 70. And I felt like, you know, uh, he had sort of lived his life for me. Mm. And that was what his pleasure was. And I don't think I gave him a fair shake. 
from 67 to 70 because I, I don't think I, I worked at it as hard as I could have. Mm. And so, you know, I got back to work and then I won, I won, obviously I won in British Open in 70 and then the PGA in 71 and uh, then I won, I don't know, a couple in 72 Masters and US Open or something. Why? Why do you say in those sixty-seven to seventy, you feel like you didn't work as hard? What? Well, I I was winning, mm. and you know I finished second and third in several majors, mm -hmm. but I don't. But I, I don't think I maybe probably prepared as well as I could have, or I, or I was really concentrating on what I was doing as much as I did prior to that or after that. Mm -hmm. And you know I, I think we all go through those. I don't didn't want to, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. Didn't realize until it hit me right in the face when my father left the, with what I had been doing, mm. and uh, it's you know I just sort of felt I felt bad about it and felt like I needed to correct that. Mm. I think it's easy to, especially in the game of golf, with our schedule being so repetitive over the years and going to the same places. Sometimes it's easy to get caught up in going through the motions. Oh yeah, right. So like it's for me over the last couple of years of finding myself and finding answers and figuring it out just like oh, yeah, you yeah. said like there, is there any ideas that you have or um well, ways that you've lived of like how to get out of that going through the motions well i'm gonna go back to, first i'm gonna go back to uh the worst year i had was 79 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i was 39 years so i didn't win a tournament that year first year i didn't win a tournament and so i took three months off i said i gotta get gotta get rid of all these bad habits mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I hit, I don't think I maybe played once or something in that three months. So I went to Jay Grout on uh, January. I said, okay, Jay Grout, I've never played golf before. Let's start over. Mm -hmm. So we uh, we started with my grip, started with posture. Uh, my, my, I got gotten very upright, so we took my hands from here to moving back get them back behind me mm -hmm. so I could get shallow again. I got mm -hmm. steep, and, and when I got steep, I lost distance because I was putting spit on the ball. Mm. Uh, I, I, I got, that was the year that, uh, I mean, I was I was chipping so badly that I was putting around bunkers. Wow. And so I went to Phil Rogers, who Phil, was, Phil and I were good friends, and I said, Phil, I need some help. So we started in Los Angeles, and they started working with me on, on, on the way he chipped and so forth and so on, and I, about, about, you know, took me a couple of months, but by the time I got to the U.S. Open at Baldus Road, my chippy got pretty good. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, those are the kind of things that, I mean, I went back and, and, and just basically went back to fundamentals of all the right things to try to get myself out of that, that situation. Mm -hmm. uh, you asked me a different question, which was what? Was was getting out of the the daily kind of repetitiveness, you know, like when when you yeah. took off for three months, like how did you get to that place of all right now I need to go back to the fundamentals? Mm -hmm. Well, I I knew that that's what I needed to do, and but I knew that my my fundamentals had gotten off, and that and my and my habits had gotten, and I instilled some some bad habits. Mm -hmm. So I needed to figure out that, but I also trusted Jay Grout at that time because I spent a lot of time with him in January that year, mm -hmm. making those changes. And so, but for me, to, I, and I'll never forget the the uh, tee shot I hit at the fifteenth hole at Baldusrol in that year, in the last round. It's a fairly it was a fairly tight tee shot at the time, and I remember getting and I remember get working like really getting back in. And, and my hands were all behind me. Mm -hmm. And I remember coming in from the inside, hit that tee shot, and it was like, I said, that's when I'm looking. <laughs> it took me a long time to get there, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I got some of it, but when, when, you, when I really needed one down the pressure, mm. and I put it, and, 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 and the, the swing stood under, under pressure, that's what you See, what happens to most people, I think, when they get bad habits? And, you know, they talk about Tiger changing his swing. Mm -hmm. Has Tiger swing ever looked different to you? Mm hmm. No, not really. Yeah, actually, no, no, actually, uh -uh. Yeah. no, uh, no. Nor does anybody else's swing look much different to you. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's I mean, their swing. from from a hundred yards away or two hundred yards away, you usually tell yeah. who's playing. Yep, right. yep. their swing. 100%. Yeah. So you really don't, not really that much, but I mean, they obviously are making changes internally within themselves. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but but what, but what people do, unless you really get rid of your bad habits, 
when you get under pressure, you're going to revert back mm -hmm. to what your, your, your what's 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 what your habit is, mm. whatever it might be, good or bad. So you try to you try to instill in yourself the, the good habits that that you want, and try to try to f forget and get rid of the other ones so that you can move forward properly. And that was that was 1980 starting off was tough for me. That's hard. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard. Take it 40 years old, and uh, you know I didn't win anything the year before, and everybody was all, hey, hey where where did he go? Mm -hmm. So you know that was tough. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to look inwards, and and figure out like okay, ask yourself the hard questions sometimes. Like, yeah. all right, what do I got to do here? That's right. And like, I think for me, when I need to reinvent myself per se, um, taking that time off like you did for the three months is so important to just like let everything okay fall by the wayside, figure out who I am, what I need. And you you had to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so did you. you, you no. Yeah, but you, but you no. <laughs> yours was yours was a little different than mine. Well, yours was something that if you didn't do it, you know, your life has been changed forever. Mm -hmm. And so, and you know, your life probably has been changed forever. Definitely. But 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 you but you did have the discipline to do that. Mm -hmm. Not many people would have had the discipline to do what you did, Morgan. Right. Next time. Um. Yeah. Well, yeah, I appreciate that. It's, um, I guess going into the next question would be perfect timing for a question about like spirituality. Is, is there anything that you carried along with you that throughout the years that you believed in or, or had a routine of, of thinking of something greater or is there, um, did you have a religion that you followed or? I, I mean, I've always been, re been a, a real Re religious in, in many ways, my own way. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not. I mean, we go to church quite often, but that's, you know, that's not. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily think going to church makes you religious. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be going, you know, believing what you believe, and who you believe in, and you know, uh, I don't think a day's pass when I can think of it in my life that I haven't prayed for something, and prayed properly. I think uh, the. Uh, uh, you know, and I, I believe in my wife. I believe in my, my kids. I believe in myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you have to believe in yourself. Uh, and and you, you believe in yourself inside. That's where you believe it, and that that you can, you can do the right thing, and 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 and, and uh, your, your actions will be, uh, be reflected in what in what actually comes out. Mm -hmm. or your, your thoughts or what how you what how I, I want to put that down I put it right but anyway you know you, you really are uh, uh, by what you do is how you are are perceived and so uh your actions your actions your, your actions are your, how you perceive I, I sort of felt like you know I always my dad always said you know uh, sportsmanship was one of the number one things you know he said when you're, when you're playing he says, if a guy plays better than you do, put that hand out, shake his hand, put a smile on your face, give him a good firm handshake, and tell him well done. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to go beat your head against the locker later, that's your, your business. But, you know, make him, he beat you. Yeah. Be happy for it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, be genuinely happy for it. Yeah. Don't be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I see tennis players, I see some of them go up and it's, Guys be crazy when they mm. shake. They all traditionally shake hands in the net. Nice. But they, some of them are really good about it. Mm. And some of them are horrible. Mm. And and it's pretty easy to understand, you know, who's horrible and who's not. And then, and, 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 and golf a lot. You shake hands every time you finish playing golf. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, I think most of the guys in golf actually are happy for the other guy. Mm. Yeah, because they know how hard it is. Yeah, because they know <laughs> yeah. how hard it is, yeah. They know how hard it is and how hard they work to get to where they get, and they're happy for it. Mm. I mean, this last week at Camila winning, <laughs> unbelievable, Amazing. fantastic, yeah. amazing, good yeah. friend of ours, so. as good as it gets. And then a little earlier this summer, Lucas Clover winning, yeah. winning twice, two in a row, two, two in a row, yeah. fantastic, so cool. I mean, yeah. we're sitting back here and I'm sitting there, I, 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 I sit there and said, "What a wonderful thing for Camila, spectacular." Yeah. And uh, you know, it's. Uh, 
I mean, and of course, I, I had, had mixed emotions too because I like Alex Noren a lot. <laughs> sure. I mean, Alex is a, Alex is a great guy. Yeah. And so, but you know, but Milos, Milos, he needed a win mm. badly. And that's mm. that's really great for him. Yeah, yeah. It's uplifting. When when we first came in here, but you know, was... but, but, you, but, but you know, you're 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 genuinely happy for the man. Yeah. You know? You're not saying you know. A lot of people say, yeah. But I, I, I'm not. I, you know, I don't. I'm, I'm not that way. You're not that way. Mm-hmm. You know, you, 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 I think. I think by by having by you being happy for somebody else is is very compassionate, mm-hmm. and it's very. Uh, it's 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 it, it, it really instills in you uh, a better feeling about yourself. Actually, you know. Sure. You, you start to get you get you get irritated and mad at yourself when you when you don't do it right and and, and then and you and then you then you, then you hourly say that it just it's just not the way to handle a thing. Mm-hmm. Well, the gratefulness for someone else's success is such an honorable thing. Oh, it is. Like, and it, as you said, the, the feeling that it instills in you—it's not a selfish thing that you do to be happy for somebody else. No. It's just something that like you can feel the reverberation of it. See, back. so that's what my dad told me when I was mm-hmm. young. That's what sort of where we started this conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, shake hands with the guy, be happy for it. Yeah. You know, and I says that to me is is is, is what my father instilled in me when I was a young kid. Has carried over for started out when I was about ten years old. Yeah. You know? And uh, uh, you know, it's uh, and you know the and proper behavior. I mean, when I was eleven years old, I we were playing. I was playing the fifteenth hole at Scioto, and I hit an eight iron shot in the bunker. And I, the the eight iron almost got to the bunker right after it <laughs> and uh my dad said you can go pick that up now and uh we can go back to the clubhouse says well you know anyway says oh i says you ever do that again or i see that again they said well, you're done playing golf well, mm. well i mean i've never said another club i never thought about it I, mean, mm-hmm. just I did the same thing with my son jackie mm. we were playing at 1972 jackie was 11 years old and we were playing at uh uh, I was playing the U.S. Open at Pebble Beach. They were playing, went down, played a day, a day at side, Spyglass. Nice. We played the first hole, and Jackie, by the time we got to the first hole, and threw in his club and that so far and so on. We went and picked up his clubs. We said, see this, we'll do this another day. We just until you learned how to do it properly, and we walked right back up that hill at Spyglass. And never had another issue. It's a big hill to think about what you just done. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. It is, as you just came down. Yeah. And what a strange golf course! You play down hit one hill, and then play spend the rest of the day climbing it back up. It's true. <laughs> but anyway, you know, it's but it was a good lesson for him. It was a mm. good lesson for me. My dad taught to me the same way that I just taught to him. Yeah. Mm. And uh, but you remember the things that your parents instill in you. Yeah. Because that's what, that, and then you try to instill that in your kids. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking over here at a picture of uh, Roger Federer as we were talking about the great statesman. You know, the game. I mean, he's one of the just classic athletes of all time. Great guy. I don't know Roger well. I've been with him three or four times, and you know, we've always had nice conversations. And yeah, you know, we've had. Uh, I can't remember. I think Roger, Roger dropped me a note about something twenty years ago. I remember when it's probably in the museum. I don't remember. <laughs> but you know, you're asking about notes people write. You know, yeah. Yeah, I I was curious as you've had the opportunity to meet you know the 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 greats and all these different sports you know what what were the things in common that you always saw in their personality or their traits you or their really, work ethic you don't really get, ever get into that is mm. you're so you're usually so uh, awed by their by who they are yeah <laughs> yeah I mean meeting Pele you know I met him at that at that banquet that yeah look at that back there in 1999 uh, or or being around. Uh, Ali, Muhammad. the picture of the first time I, I met Ali is right up I right up there on the wall, yeah. and uh, <laughs> you know, good. you don't really get into a conversation about that kind of stuff. Sure, Ali was a really nice guy, mm. and he could hardly talk at that point in his life, but he, wow. but he was he couldn't have been nicer, mm. and uh, you know, those are the kind of things that you remember, uh, and. Uh, I, you know, it's not, uh, it's not, well, how did you do this? What, what or why did you, I didn't do it. Right. We got into that. Mm, yeah. Not enough time. Well, well not only that, but they didn't want to talk about that. Right, right. Yeah. You know, 
I knew what they had to do. They knew what they had to do. We both knew what each other had to do mm -hmm. to get where we got. Mm -hmm. And so we just we talk about it. It's like a common understanding. That's, exactly. Yeah. That, that's what I think. Like a respect. Yeah. There's a common respect for each one of those athletes mm -hmm. and what they did and what, how they did it and, what, how, uh, and so forth, how they put it all together. Yeah. yeah. Goes without being said. Yeah. Speaking, you brought up Barbara um, and your kids and your grandkids and... I have a family now and a daughter, one year old, she turns one tomorrow and tomorrow. yeah, tomorrow it's time flies. Uh, and I'd love to know more about like your family and how, um, how close you hold them and what are some, what are some things that talking about lessons with, with Jackie and, and things that you, you say so proudly that I have a great family and, and all of them turned out well, what are some things that you teach them or um, continue just, on the generations. Just, just be a father. Just be a father and love them. Mm -hmm. And you're, they're, they're all going to go in different directions and you got to adjust with whatever their directions are and try to give them guidance. And, you know, uh, you just got to always be there for them. You know, that's, that's just what, that's basically what it is. I mean, you can't plan what you're trying to do for your family. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to lay this out for them. No, you can't do that. Yeah. You know, you may have ideas and plans, but I think that they've got their own ideas and plans. And I think that the more that they grow and uh, uh, become individuals, and the more you can help them do that, mm. be their own person rather than be having them be your person. I mean, Jackie, for instance, I mean, if I had known I was going to be playing golf, I'd never named him after me. Mm. I mean, I was, I went a professional golfer yet when he was born. Right. I wanted right after I won my second U.S. Amateur, he was born. And so uh, I didn't know I was going to play golf. And, uh, uh, you know, he often asked, he says, why, why did you name me after? Well, Jackie, I didn't know. I wouldn't have done that. Mm. Would, have, would have saddled you with that. Mm. But uh, he was... Uh, See, I forgot. I forgot what the devil I was going to tell you. Um, well, he carries the name with such class. I mean, yeah, well, Jackie's he, fantastic. He, 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 yeah, he's had he's had a he's had a hard time with it. Time, but I think there's been more pluses than there are negatives. Yeah. Uh, it's opened more doors and then shut them. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's uh, you know had to be. Oh, I know one was. I said, you know, one of the things I want to do is just. Uh, you know, he wanted to play golf. I said, that's fine. But I wanted him to play golf because he wanted to play golf, not because I wanted him to play golf. Yeah. So I felt like if I can get him through high school liking the game of golf, mm. then, then it's fine because he was obviously growing up with everywhere. They were right there all the time. Mm -hmm. When they go off to college, so they'll, you know. I mean, I see a lot of kids that, that I see at the Bears Club. I see on the range with, the parents badgering him about how yeah. doing this. But that kid goes off to college. They're not going to look at a golf club. Yeah, it's you true. Know? Yeah, but I, but if but if they really like it, mm. I mean, and Jackie, Gary, uh, Steve, Michael. I mean, uh, Steve Steve played football, but but Steve's a pretty still a pretty good player, and the other three turned pro. Mm. Uh, they all must have liked it, mm. and they didn't turn pro because I wanted to turn pro. That's what they they decided. That's what they wanted to do. That was, and, and then, but they all came back to me and said, "Dan, why didn't you give us more guidance on how to play golf?" And so I says, "Guess I says, I want you to play because you because we, you wanted to play, not mm. because I wanted. If I if I start pressuring you into playing, and there's only one guy that I know whose father was on him like a tent, and he turned out loving to play. That's Tiger. Mm. I mean, his dad pushed him hard into the game." Yeah, but for for how many individuals are there like Tiger, they would accept that and, and move forward with it. True, not many. Yeah. yeah, and so you know, I I always felt like if Jackie wanted to play golf, he was already saddled with my name, and then he would play. Mm -hmm. And uh, hey, decent player, won a couple of college tournaments, won the North South, you know, uh, didn't didn't ever want a pro tournament, but he you know he, he played some decent golf. Yeah, and uh, but uh, had I given him more fundamentals, could he have been better? Probably. Same with Gary. Probably could have been better. But, you know, <laughs> no, I, 
I, I want them to do what they want to do, not yeah. what I want them to do. It's up to them to come to you for advice. And, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah, I think that's so important. Yeah, my dad was, was the opposite. I, he, he wanted to be a pro and got me in it. And once I started getting good, he kind of pressured me and to keep working at it. And that's when I had to leave and become my own person. When I was 15, I went to a golf academy and just like- You had to do your own thing. Do my own thing and figure it out for myself. Yeah, that's yeah. right, exactly. As you, 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 you experienced exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. makes me feel better hearing it from Mr. <laughs> Nicholas. <Smith. laughs> what? Makes me feel good hearing it from you that it was similar to what you done gives me hope that like especially with Camilo and then yep. Luke now and that still got time and just like so inspirational hearing things for you so yeah it's cool yeah I want to go back to your marriage with Barbara I mean it's such an unbelievable accomplishment to have spent this length of a lifetime mm -hmm. together and build such an incredible family tree I mean as someone personally that's aspiring to you know uh find a marriage and and someone to spend the rest of my life with you know what are the biggest things that you look for in an individual that you can span the test of time with and and learn as you go that's a that's a hard question to answer because <laughs> yeah I never, I never really searched for it mm. just happened mm. um you know barbara's grew up in a family her father was a high school math teacher taught my dad in high school uh he'd never made more than six thousand dollars a year uh he was home at, uh, you know, four thirty every day. I guess coming after after school. Uh, that was that's what he did. Mm. And she, you know, Barbara was a product of that. She grew up that. And she was very organized and uh, uh, you know very uh, caring about uh, her dad and mother were very caring people and instilled that in her mm. and. I was fortunate to be part of a recipient of that. And so my parents were much the same way. Mm -hmm. My parents were just, you know, very Midwestern, pretty simple, simple people that, you know, didn't really, never, there was no flash or pizzazz in, in, in that. And so uh, we all just sort of, Barbara and I, you know, you know, I mean, most people would not understand this, but. Uh, when we got engaged, I I never asked her to marry me. Hmm. I mean, uh, we were we were 19 years old at Christmas time. I just had a well Christmas present was a ring box. She opened the ring, put it on. <laughs> never I've never asked her to marry me. Wow, that's cool. I mean, how many how many people could do that? Yeah. <laughs> and you know, uh, I never talked to her dad about it. I never talked. I, it's just we we just sort of. This is what we were going to do. Mm. We both wanted kids. We wanted kids early. We wanted to grow up with our kids. Mm. So Barbara, Barbara would, Barbara got pregnant the next, the, the next, the next year. Where she, Jackie came along. Let's see, they came along fourteen. Yeah, I guess fourteen months after we got married. Mm. And you know, Barbara got pregnant in college, so she decided to double up her last two semesters when she got pregnant, wow. or two quarters. So he got to 21 or two hours the last two quarters and graduated early so she, you know, spent the last part of her pregnancy at that. I mean, but Bar Barbara never made a fuss about having a baby. I mean, I always, to me, it looks to me like she was going to the grocery store to buy a loaf of bread. <laughs> I mean, seriously, she made zero fuss. Wow. I mean, uh, I'll never forget the, uh, the when Jackie was born. Uh I was getting ready to go to Cincinnati to, to defend the, the uh, because the U.S. Pro-Am, I was with my golf coach, Bob Kepler. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were, it was on a Friday. And so uh, I call, I was with her and so forth. I said, I said, I'll call you tonight. And I, so I called her that night. She said, you doing all right? She said, yeah, I'm fine. No problem. And so that was, you know, didn't think anything about it. Uh, Eight o'clock the next morning, she called me, and I said, why are you calling me at 8 o'clock? Is she doing that compared to 1? She said, oh, I just wanted to call you and tell you you're a dad. No way. That's how Jackie was born. And it was like, it was no big deal. Wow. And she knew that I wanted to play the golf tournament. I was going to play this golf tournament. And so she didn't want to interfere with that while she had with the baby. 
Anyway, I walked. I came back that night from San Francisco, Cincinnati. Drove back to Columbus, went out and saw Jackie there. Psh, I keeled straight over backwards onto a terrazzo floor. <laughs> Whacked my head. No, I mean, yeah. No way. And I, I might pass out with all my kids. Really? First, first four, yeah. And last one, I took I took pill and smelling salts. <laughs> just just from sheer <laughs> happiness. The only time I ever passed out in my life. Wow. I wow. Know. Yeah. Uh, I remember the, uh, the and Steve was you know, pretty, not a whole lot, but uh, we got Nan, uh, when she was getting ready, it was May, f when we had an exhibition on May 4th, 1965. I was mm -hmm. playing at Scioto, sort of a pre-runner of the Memorial Tournament, which was uh, uh, for the American Cancer Society. I played uh, with our club pro, Walker Inman, and Bob Hope and Jim Garner. Mm -hmm. And Garner and Hope were great guys. They were just fantastic. And uh, uh, we played a round of golf. Barbara was pregnant, so she rode around a cart. And uh, we got back to, went back to our house in Columbus for, for dinner. And she says to me, she says, Jack, she says, uh, you want to fix a fire? I said, oh, I, we're going to play a game of pool, Barb. I'll, I'll be up in the office bar. And about 15 minutes later, she says, Jack, the fire's ready. She will cook the steak. I said, hey, cook the fire. So I fixed the fire. Don't worry about it. No big, no big deal. <laughs> and so uh, we, she said about 10 minutes later, she called back up. She called and says, uh, steak's on, but food's, food's on the table. I said, Barbara, I said, I said, don't worry about it. I know you're with your friends. Just go ahead and, uh, you know, food's on the table, though. Come on up. So it was about 9 o'clock. So about 9.30, she excused herself from the table. I didn't think anything of it. She didn't come back. It got to be about 10. And I said, let's find out where Barbara is. I went back to the bedroom. She says, I've called. I've called the doctor. She says, I'll call a taxi. You stay here with your friends. I'll take a taxi to go to the, air, go to the hospital. Mm. I said, what are you talking about? And I said, so I went in. I mean, that house just, everybody got out of that house in five seconds. Yeah. Uh -oh. And we went to the hospital. I mean, this is like 1030. Dan was born at 10, 11, 12, 15. Mm. Wow. I mean, wow. that's that was Barbara. She's that's, amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Now, the next day, I next day I, was, I had went to Cincinnati. So I, but Nan was born, and I went to Cincinnati with Bob Hope. Yeah. And we played an exhibition, of course, called Makatiwa. Mm hmm And I had the greatest lesson of my life. Uh, so I went down there, and uh, from the time we got there to the time we left, they pulled at Hope. Hey, Bob, take a picture with me. Hey, Bob, how about saying thanks for the memories? Hey, Bob, you know, tell us a joke. Hey, Bob, do this. Hey, Bob, do that, so forth and so on. He did everything. He was <laughs> unbelievable. I got back that night, and I said to Barbara, I said, Barbara, I learned the greatest lesson in the world today. I said, I played with a guy, one of the most popular celebrities in the world. He was pulled out from every direction. He accommodated everybody. Mm. Wow. I said, if you can do that, and she makes it, and he smiled with all of the smile. Yeah. And so I, I mean, I learned a great lesson from Hope. So I, I tried to do that with kids, you know, mm. making sure they're deciding the autographs, doing the things, trying to do things. But it was, you know, you learn things in life. And, and Bob Hope's lesson was a pretty good lesson for me. Mm. It's so important because every kid, especially that you meet, it's going to change their life and they're going to carry that story with oh, yeah. them throughout their whole life. Sure, they are. That's really, really special. What, um, do you have any best friends that you keep in touch with constantly or? Oh, well, I got guys from college, sure. From college? Yeah, they're all, they're still all in Columbus, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I got some guys that, uh, that, that I see every once in a while. But, uh, you know, my, my, the guys that I spend most of my time with, with guys I play golf with. I mean, I play golf, a lot of golf with Arnold. I spent a lot of time with Arnold. Gary Player, I spent a lot of time with Gary. Mm -hmm. uh, Watson, I spent a lot of golf time with Watson. Don't see them off of that much anymore. But, you know, I'm, I actually I spend more time with my kids than I do with anybody. Mm, yeah. You know? yeah. Jack, you're 83 years old, and you look awesome, and you're walking around and cruising around and making jokes, and I just, me being a health nut now, I want to know, like, what your routine is. How do you stay fit and, and sharp? <laughs> and I do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you just I never, and when I was playing, I never, I never did any exercise other than I, well I play I played other sports mm -hmm. in other words I played uh, I always kept myself 
actually played basketball. I played at rec league till I was about 40. Oh, wow. And uh, I played, uh, I always go to the kids' basketball practice. I go to kids' football practices every day. You know, mm -hmm. the afternoon, I'd, I'd throw to the receivers or I'd kick with the kickers or, you know, I did all that. And uh, baseball, I'd go pick batting practice and so forth, and you know. And, uh, you know, I played tennis and then, you know. I did. I just kept active. Stay busy, mm. active. In other words, I, I, I hate. I see what kids specialize today. Mm. Drives me crazy, because mm. I mean, your your body just doesn't handle that. Yeah. Your body doesn't does does. I think if you get your body, or your you can do all kinds of things, then you you can handle anything. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm virtually I'd knock on wood, but I virtually be never injured. Wow. You know when I played. Yeah, that's great advice. That's one we just did a podcast with Don Salad, you know, my trainer. One thing that we always train for is to be an athlete, not just to be a golfer. Yeah, you know, and I, you, we have tennis courts in your in your backyard here, and and always, yeah, being an athlete, I think, is key. Well, we 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 built this house in 1970. I looked at, it, I said, you yeah, know, what, what are the kids going to do? So I bought the extra lot. Mm. It's the smartest thing I ever did, and. We ended up having, we had like 30 sub kids on the street when the kids were growing up. Nice. And we had a decathlon every weekend. <laughs> I mean, we come down, we'd be kicking footballs, throwing passes, pitching balls, shooting hoops, yeah. tennis balls, you know, whatever, and running races. And I did all that with them. Yeah. So, yeah, that was, uh, that was my way of trading. Uh, I think I've, uh, you know, I probably, I eat pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the only one thing I my my biggest downfall is ice cream. <laughs> I happen to like ice cream, but uh, outside of that, I, I eat pretty healthy. Uh, uh, I I get a lot of sleep. Uh, I try not to uh, do things I shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. uh, just try to be smart with what I do. Nice. Do you still have your own ice cream brand? No. No. <laughs> no, we we were in we were in a ton of uh, Kroger's and, and and public stores and and both stores changed buyers. Oh, you change buyers, they change what they do. <laughs> yeah, put it out of business actually. That was cool though. I remember getting one of those mm -hmm. pints with the Jack Nicholas. Yeah, it was good. Oh, cool. Ice cream was actually quite good. Yeah, it was. It was very uh, economical and it was good. Awesome. Hmm. Um, yeah, on that same page, we you know you've you've diversified from golf so much in your life and different business ventures and. Uh, I'd love to just hear generally how you've balanced playing golf and business together. But beyond that, as passionate golfers that have, you know, grown up playing your golf courses, when did golf course design become such a passion for you? Was it? Well, well, Jay, I, I don't think that I've, say I've been much as a businessman. I, I mean, yeah. I've been involved in businesses. I got businesses, but I tried to subdue that while I was playing golf. Sure. Uh, you know, I saw, uh, some managers who took some of these young guys and just, you know, they win something. All of a sudden, they're all over the world doing stuff, and then pretty soon their golf game deteriorates. Right. And golf is my game, mm. and that's what I enjoy doing. I didn't enjoy enjoying sitting in front of a camera, smiling, and say, "Gee, look at my pretty shirt," you know. <laughs> I mean, that's not what I want to do. Mm. And yeah, you know, although I have some of that, yeah. But uh, I try to keep that on a low key. Uh, what I really got, became passionate about is as I. Go to longest golf course design. I get uh, Pete Dye got me involved uh, oh, about I'm guessing sixty five or six. Yeah, he was doing uh, uh, the golf club in Columbus. So he called me and Pete Dye played a lot of amateur golf against each other and and been friends for a long time. And he said, "Hey, say I want you to come out and take a look at what I'm doing at the golf club." I said, "Why do you want me to do that, Pete?" I said, "Why? Well, I said, I want your opinion on what's going on." I said, Pete, I don't know anything about golf course design. He said, you know, more than you think. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, I'll come out. So I went out. First hole was a little down the hill, back dog leg up to the right. And pretty simple to see what the hole was going to look like. Mm -hmm. Second hole went out, and it went over the top of this hill. The bunker's on the top of the hill, and it disappeared. And I said, what is this? He says, oh, this is a takeoff of a hole at Presswick. I said, really? I said, I'd never been to Presswick. I said, well, that's what this is, and so forth. I said, okay. We got to the third hole. And it was a round green with four round bunkers. And there's this little creek bed in front of it. And I said, and he says, he said, what do you think? I said, what do I think? I said, it looks like Mickey Mouse in any direction you turn. <laughs> and 
And he said, I said, it looks terrible. I said, well, what would you do? I says, I don't know what I, he said, yeah, you do. What would you do? So I said, okay, let's take one of those buckers and relate it to the creek. And then mm. I said, well, then balance it off with a couple of things over here, over the butter to get rid of the other thing. He did it. Nice. And then about three other holes, he did it on the golf course too. Mm. And we finished the golf course thing up. And then he said, he said, well, that was fun. I said, yeah, I enjoyed that, Pete. That was fun. He says, he said, would you like to consult with me if we ever had an opportunity to do so? I said, sure, that'd be fun. So a couple of years later, Charles Fraser called Mark McCormick at Sea Pines Plantation down in Hilton. Yeah. And Charles said, you got anybody up there that would, uh, I need a name for a golf course? And he says, hey, Mark said, well, Jack's getting interested in it. He said, he hadn't done anything, but he said, like, he said, well, Charles called me and he said, he said, Jack, he'd like to talk to you about doing a golf course. I said, well, Charles, I said, I have no, can't do a golf course. I had no idea how to do a golf course. He said, I said, I consult with a fellow named Pete Dye. He says, he's never heard of him. And I said, well, you will. Nice. <laughs> wow. And so anyway, so Pete got the job. We went in. We had a fee of $40,000, which we put back into the golf course. Nice. We never got paid a dime, as hmm. it turned out. I made 23 trips in there in a jet. Wow. Never got reversed one dime. Wow, that's crazy. And, you know, but it was the greatest experience I ever mm. had. I loved it. And mm. so Pete and I did about a half a dozen courses together. And then and was, then I finally got tired. So I told Pete I couldn't afford him because mm. he took every every time we got a fee, we put it back in the golf course. And Pete, Pete, Pete had some money and his wife had money. And so he didn't need that. He just did it for the fun. I said, okay. And so... Uh, I said, but I can't do that. I can't. I'm still trying to play golf and try to do all this. I can't. If I'm going to do this, I got to get, you know, something payment for. So anyway, I, uh, we said it was about the time I started Muirfield, and I so I I, I got Muirfield financed, and uh, uh, we found we needed somebody to help land plan what Muirfield was going to be because we had had like 1,560 acres at Muirfield, and so. Uh, we read, we read about Desmond Muirhead, who would, yeah. who was a, who was also a golf course designer, but he also did the housing development, and did all the land planning and so forth and so on. So he taught me a little bit how to land plan and how to do this and how to do that from from a house view. That's why Muirfield sits in the valley, the houses set above it. They don't, they're not really not in play, not not in play at all. Yeah, or visual and a lot no, of holes. No, yeah. No. So, so it's so that's that's sort of Desmond. Like Desmond did that. I did about half a golf. Dozen golf courses with Desmond, and but Desmond, Desmond was you know he he was he was an intellectual, mm. and he would I mean he would do some really strange things, and so finally I got said you know I'm tired of compromising this I said I think I'd like to do this on my own and then the Royal Canadian Golf Association called me and said they wanted to do a golf course they like Beerfield and they want to do a golf course called Glen Abbey, mm. and so. And that's what they were going to call it. And so I went up and I did Glen Abbey. And that was my first individual golf course. And, and De, uh, Jay Morish was working for Desmond Burehead. I, I took Jay with me. Hmm. And he was my Mr. Outside. Then Bob Cup, I, 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 he was looking for, uh, looking for a guy for drawing. And so Cup was, was, a, good, was, was a good drawer. He, he had done uh, drawings for Ted Williams' book and a variety of other things. And so... So I put the two of them together, and they were my industry inside and outside that I took. And what we do is we get a piece of ground. We'd all three go to a separate office. Bob would do a routing, Jay would do a routing, routing, and I would do a routing, and then we'd bring it together. And that's, that's how we'd start a golf course. That's cool. Huh? And so uh, I started doing that. And then probably about uh, 1980, I'm guessing uh, uh, 82 or 3, uh, Chuck Perry was my CEO at the time, and Chuck said to me, he says, Jack, he said, don't you think it's about time we took this avocation that you got and made a vocation out of it? Because mm -hmm. we never made any money. Mm -hmm. We didn't care about making money. We were having fun building golf courses. And I did that. I did like, Land Abbey, Shoal Creek, Castle Pines, Annandale. Uh, of course, we would all had tournaments on. Yeah, Sweet spots. yeah. And, amazing spots. And, you know, a variety of things. And so... Uh, we did. We started. We decided it's time to go to, to, to make a business out of it, mm. and so we started started doing that. And as you grew, I've done, I, I've done uh, probably three hundred twenty golf courses myself, and the company had, had done maybe five hundred fifty or so. Wow! Wow! Yeah. How long does it take from beginning of like the idea to? Well, it depends where you are. If you're in the southern right. part of the United States, uh, 
if you're in Florida, 12 months, you could start start with it. You can be planted 12 mm -hmm. months, and, and it takes two seasons. So if you're up north, it takes, you know, two summer seasons. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I just played Panther National for the first time. And it's amazing. I can't believe, like, how much elevation change and dirt and just, like, the variety of holes there. It's incredible. Yeah. What, what, do you, yeah. what do you think of it? How well, it turned out? Well, I think it turned out pretty nicely. I think <laughs> what what uh, that the genesis of that is that it uh, it was properties with seventeen and a half foot elevation, which was below floodplain. Mm -hmm. So they had to raise the property to twenty two and a half feet, and we had zero environmental restrictions. Wow, zero. So because it was just a pasture land, mm -hmm. and so we ra but to raise it five feet, we had to dig lakes. So we got lakes out there that are 30, 40 feet deep. Right. And Dominic Sen, who was the uh, uh, the owner, mm -hmm. was a skier. And Dominic wanted some elevation. I said, well, well let's put some elevation. So uh, Chris Cocker did a really nice job of putting together. Uh, he and I, we did a routing on it. And then we did, and then we started talking about landforms and put it together. And then I let Chris play around with what we did. And they put more of a landform than I thought they were going to put into it, which they think was right. I mean, people, you'll drive onto that property and say, man, how did you find a piece of property like this in South Florida? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's 100% created. Yeah. Wow. Because you look around it, it's just like this tabletop. Right. And so uh, I think it turned out nice. I think it's going to be a, a really good golf course. I think it's, uh, uh, it's uh, I don't know how difficult it is. I don't think it's probably that difficult, but it's uh, it's got it's got a little spice in it. Yeah, you can play mm -hmm. it, I mean, Back to almost eight thousand yards or something like it that. Go close, it, go, it, go, it gets close to eight thousand back. Yeah, sure. and it's out there, so it can be windy too. I mean, could be, could be. Yeah, it was a good test. I just love the variety of holes. Like that's what golf should be for me. Like a drivable par four, a short, short par three, a long par three. Yeah, it's it's got a it's got a variety of things. Yeah, biggest green I ever built is out there's a fifteenth green. Yeah, eighty seven yards deep. Yeah, is that what it is? Eighty-seven. I knew it was. I knew it was close to hundred yards. Yeah. Oh, we God. ended up. We drew this island, and they they had uh, the first try of it was putting a green on there. And I and I and I, and I looked at it. And I said, No, no, guys. I said, We need to. These are houses on the other side of this water. So we got to get these houses in view. So we, I said, we got to take this all the crap down and let's move the green over here to the water. I said, and then we built the peninsula too big. So let's just let's just do a big green. Which is, let's just stretch through the green back here. Let's put a couple of bunkers in here. Let's put one to get to create a green area back here, create a green area here, front and water, and then another green area in the, in the center that's kind of the soil. Mm -hmm. And it turned out we just took up the whole space, which was, so you say, 87 yards. And you stand back on the tee, it doesn't look like that. No, not but at all. It, mm -hmm. But it, uh, you know, it's basically three holes. And then you got the elevation of the tee to play up top if you want mm -hmm. to or down below. It's got a lot of interesting things. Then you follow it up with a driving bar four. Yeah. Which I can I think 16th hole is really a neat little golf hole. I agree. It's really yeah. special. I haven't made it out there yet, but look. Yeah, you'll enjoy it. it. It's yeah. it's fun. I think it's it's a good golf course, and uh, you know, JT was out there a little bit with it, and, and, and mm -hmm. contributed a little bit here there or there, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it was uh, it was it was nice. I hope he he's you know, that's how I started. Rats close to the same age as he is. If you got if you have an interest and you want to start and so forth. But you know, he's, he's still he's still making a living doing other things right now. He's like he's not going to start doing what I did. Yeah, pretty good living. Yeah. <laughs> when when you first go into designing a golf course, how much is it just you you see the land for the first time and holes start to shape? Like you talked about the golf club, the first hole kind of told you where it wanted to go. How much do you take a blank slate of you know paper and kind of draw well, a hole versus the, the path, land it, telling you? Path, actually, you just you, you basically do a. A routing that we figured figure then 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 put landforms with it, mm. but in most times you try to find out what you, you're trying to see the the, the property. And other I, I met with the client yesterday, and uh, uh, we were talking about what to do. It's all saying his property, mm. and I said, you know, I said I need to get to your property yet because we've been talking here we're long distance away, and uh, I said I need to get to the property. To, to see, see what the feel is. It's got mountains around it and, and a river running through it. And it's got, you know, it's got a, a lot of things happening. And I said, but I said, you got to get, you got to get there to get the feel of it. Mm -hmm. I can get a feel on paper, but it, it, some, you need to know what the, what the whole thing is. Mm -hmm. It's all, it's a package. 
It's mm. not just a golf course. It's what, 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 how does it fit into its environment? Mm. And so uh, you need to do that, and then you start working, you build off of it. Uh, you know, I think uh, Shoal Creek was an interesting thing. I, we had Shoal Creek, and, I, and what I usually do is I let the guys uh, stake a routing that we've come up with. And then we go walk it. And when Jay and Bob and I walked uh, uh, Shoal Creek, we walked the front nine and I got done with it and I didn't say a word to anybody. I just turned around and started walking backwards. And took the ninth hole and walked backwards. And I put the eighth hole. Because I've been thinking about it as we were going. And we, I walked all the way. I, I reversed the hole back the whole nine. And that's where, the way the course plays today. Uh -huh. And But it was like, you know, this fits here, this fits here, this doesn't fit here, this fit. You know, how do we not have to move a lot here to make this work? How do we do this to make this work? You, know, you, 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 you got to figure, figure out what, what's going on and what, what you have to do to make things work. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, before we kind of start to wrap this up with some final questions at the end, I'd love to, you know, hear your thoughts on the general landscape in the game of golf right now. I mean, we've had so much change in you know, investment coming into the game, different leagues that have started. I mean, what what are your thoughts on the direction of the game and where things well, are headed right now? I think the game of golf is uh, uh, reasonably healthy. Hmm. We have a obviously have a little bit of confrontation within professional golf with LIV and what's going on. Uh, I'll try to stay out of that controversy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that... Uh, LIV is uh, uh, woke up the PGA Tour a little bit, mm. to some degree. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, but I don't think the PGA Tour could sustain what was going on, so that's why they're they've got a sort of bringing things together. I talked to Jay uh, Monahan a couple of days ago, and I said, Jay, don't tell me because I don't want to have to talk about it. Mm. And I said, that, and I don't want to, I'd rather say somebody, I don't know. I said, just tell me, are you doing all right or not? He says, I think we're doing fine. Mm. So that's where I think we're going. He says, so I said, Jay thinks we're moving fine. I think Jay is a good man. Uh, you know, I think he took a, they took a pretty bad rap about what it went on because I don't think, I think it was beyond his scope mm -hmm. when they did the thing. I think Jimmy Dunn and Ed Hurley here are, uh, are good men and I think they'd understand what's going on. They understand business better, what they would have they'd, I think they'll figure out something. I think it'll come out. I think the game of golf will come out to the better at the end. Mm. You know, some of the guys that went to LIV was probably okay for them late in their career. You know, the Charles Schwartzels, Brandon Grace, Mickelson, uh, Dustin. Uh, Brooks. Uh, Brooks is, I, think, I guess he's not later. In his yeah. No, I, I see. I don't think Brooks or DeChambeau or uh, uh, a couple of the young guys that went. Cameron Smith, I mean, I thought that was kind of, that was odd for them because that puts them in a pretty awkward position for the rest of their life. Mm. But, you know, there's there's something to everything for everybody. Yeah. Look at the positive side rather yeah. than the negative side of it. And so, well, I say, I always said the proof, proof will be in the pudding. Mm. We don't know what the pudding is yet. Yeah. Yeah. So let's just sort of wait and see and see what happens and let the guys that are, that are smarter than I am and probably smarter than most of the people are <laughs> figure it out, come up with something that helps grow the game of golf. And I'm in favor of anything that grows the game of golf and makes it a better day. Yeah. Like this. And on the topic of golf, I just thought of this and I'd love to ask you this question. Why would you tell a kid today to get into playing the game of golf? Well, I think the game of golf teaches you so many things. Mm -hmm. It teaches you how to deal with adults. It teaches you mm -hmm. discipline, it teaches you uh, uh, how to, Again, to be compassionate, it can be uh, teaches you sportsmanship, teaches you, you know, the first tee is gets into all the, the right things for yeah, for kids. Spectacular. And golf is that's basically what golf is, and uh, uh, you know, I think that what a, you know, whether you play golf for a living, I mean, or play or or or, or just play golf, yeah. what a great sport. I mean, I mean, you know, you know, I just redid the Bears Club this summer. Yeah. I mean, the members come back, you know. Half of them are 15 to 18 handicaps. They love it. Yeah. But they love, you know, 
they love being involved. They don't understand what, what's going on or what I did, but they love what they see. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I try to make a game, a golf course, aesthetically pleasing with good golf shots. Yeah. So if you can do that, then you really please, because the average golfer doesn't care what, you know, really what the shots are because they don't understand them. Mm. But but the, but the good player does. He, he understands that. So I think I've got pretty good tee shots. You get tighter tee shots out there than you had before. For sure. Mm. So, so it gives the guys good practice, but the average golfer doesn't get to that spot, so it doesn't really make any difference. Yeah. And uh, try to keep people out of trouble, you know. But, you know, the average golfer is out there to enjoy it, have be fun, have a good time. With her, uh, with her friends, and and, and, and and be taken care of. Mm. I don't remember what the question was, Jamie, but <laughs> no, you you answered it spot on around around why kids should get into the game of golf with well, with the they, wisdom like, that it brings. Yeah, I just think to get because they can play all their life. Yeah, they can play all their life. They can deal with their friends. They can do it with business. They can they may get good enough to be able to play golf. Sure, I mean you can play golf competitively. You don't have to play as a pro. Yeah, play golf competitively all over the world today at all kinds of events. Yeah, it's fun. Fun. And it's the best. <laughs> Brought the best. so many amazing friendships and experiences. And I take one thing uh, in incredibly uh, to heart that you said today about competition. I mean, if you've got something in you that you're trying to work on, you, you can't get through it unless you enter yourself in that competition and prove to yourself through the hardship of that. Mm. You know, And that's the joy in it, too. Competition, to me, there's just a joy. I mean, people said, how do you stand the pressure coming up the 18th floor? I said, what are you talking about? That's what I practice for work yeah. for, is to get to that point, to have that pressure. Exactly. That's the whole point. Yeah. yeah. Speaking about golf, I'm sure you've had <clears throat> countless goals throughout your career. What are some goals that you have in life now for going forward? Oh, I don't know. I think that... Uh, uh, Right now, I'm try, I'd, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to do a few more golf courses and do a little bit of that. Uh, see, watch how my kids are growing up. I, my my grandkids are all doing things now. They're all in some sort of business, doing a variety of things. I'd like to be part of what they're doing. I don't have any personal goals for myself, <clears throat> and I don't think Barbara probably has any personal goals for other than other than our kids, mm -hmm. our grandkids. And you know, we've been a family, and that's. Uh, Want to stay a family and be part of uh, uh, watching them grow up and, and live a very useful, productive life, and, and and leave this place a better place than where we saw it when we came. It's a very meaningful mission. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, our final question is: Our podcast is called "I Can Fly." I what? I can fly. I can fly. Me. May, there's many reasons for it for us. I'm I'm a pilot myself. I just love the feeling of flying, not just being in an airplane, but um, the feeling you get when you're doing something special for me. Um, and we all have our own certain meanings for, for it, for our, for the way we live. And I, I want to know what it means for you when you say, I can fly. Did you have any feelings of flying in your career or your life? Or? Well, I, I mean, I flew an airplane. I mean, <laughs> I had about 800 hours as a student pilot. Oh, wow. Went through flight safety up in New York. That's when I found out I was colorblind. Uh -huh. I was trying to get a private in the Lear. Dang. And it's a, you know, in the private, a little rocket. I think I was going to like, kill myself. That <laughs> yeah, thing. that thing is a rocket. Yeah. And so I, I was probably uh, probably good that I found out I was colorblind. I couldn't demonstrate on the field what was going on. Mm -hmm. I should have known that from golf. I mean, I can never see a red line on green on green grass. Oh, really? <laughs> no. But anyway, uh, you know, to me, I, I can fly sort of would mean to me that uh, I can do what I want to do and do it well and contribute. Mm. You know, and, 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 and see, see not only did I grow, but I want to see other people grow from experiences I've had that I can help them grow. Mm. My family particularly, and I, anybody who comes to me, a lot of the young pros and so forth, if I can, if I can impart upon them some of the things that have happened to me that will help them, that to me makes me feel better. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. Can't thank you enough for the time today. This is an Pleasure. absolute Pleasure. I enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. I wish you well with your podcast. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. You better darn well get a sponsor. You're spending a lot of time and a lot of money here to get this thing done. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this is too good of a pleasure and an absolute treat. So just thank the, you very much. Just the beginning. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, guys. Thanks. <laughs>